Hello, intelligent beings of the Enderweb. This is the fourth part of the four-part series, and if you haven't seen the previous ones, doing so is definitely recommended. Moscow government's approach to one of the biggest challenges of urban living, waste disposal, is very colonial. The solution is to dump garbage away from the city center. This, however, creates popular revolt, and thus, during the past few years, the city experiments with dumping waste a bit far away. Such choice created one of the largest environmental protests in Russia, Stop Shias in the Russian North. Activists united in a fight against a garbage dump near Shias train station in Arkhangelsk Oblast. Their courage was strong, and they won a rarity nowadays. The problem, however, remains. The city prefers garbage dumps, it's the simplest solution. The next simplest solution used in Moscow is incineration, but as activists note, it is troubled at least with poor filtering. The lack of sorting also does not help. Moscow technically has sorting, but the efficiency is questionable. The city had installed recyclable and unrecyclable bins in residential areas, but the explanation was very brief and limited. There is very little trust that the waste wouldn't be dumped into one truck. Moreover, for who is called waste, many people are used to another arrangement. Мусоропровод, a waste pipe, which is a norm in buildings taller than five stories. While this is good accessibility-wise, this creates a need for additional janitors, and the convenience further motivates people away from sorting the waste. Smaller waste bins almost universally are for everything. Divided waste bins are rare, the color scheme changes from place to place, and once again, you have to not only care about sorting, but trust that your garbage will get sorted and not put in the same truck on disposal. Besides, even if disposed separately, where's the trust that it actually gets recycled? While incineration is officially considered a form of recycling. In September 2020, one morning I noticed a peculiar sight of a melted garbage bin. There was a fire inside that morning. The local handyman recommended me to call the company in charge of garbage collecting to ask for a replacement, which I did to find out that the phone number is for sale. The city, the country, when it comes to environmental protection, can barely be trusted. In past years, Northeastern Horde Highway had been constructed and opened, briefly mentioned in the first part of the series. It was constructed partially demolishing Kuskova Forest Park and replacing a green area in Vishniki, passing meters away from a 17th-century church, the oldest remaining structure in the area. It's been reported that the church already has cracks in its structure, and the continuous vibration from the motorway can't be much helpful here. With the continuous construction of motorways within the city, Moscow government makes the same mistake from almost half a century ago, as in Seoul, Tokyo, Los Angeles, mistake that is now being addressed overseas because highways do not help with the traffic. They simply incentivize the use of motor vehicles, making traffic jumps simply larger. But in Moscow it gets worse. Another highway, Southeastern Horde, is currently being constructed just meters away from the windows of residential buildings, like here in Kuryanova. But it's not even the whole set of problems. Southeastern Horde motorway is being constructed on top of an unaccounted nuclear waste deposit in Moskvarecha Saburova over a slope adjacent to Moskva River. There, a Soviet polymetal plant been dumping some of their radioactive waste half a century ago. Deposits of spots emitting high levels of alpha, beta and gamma radiation have been recorded officially and unofficially perhaps hundreds of times. However, those who protested were forced out, and during the pandemic the construction had begun. Easily seen from the nearby Moskvarycha train station, a part of Moscow Central Diameter 2 line. The radioactive particles dug up from there will gladly travel around the city on the wheels of cars and roofs of trains. The city government considers it's more important to construct a highway on top of a radioactive waste deposit near residential buildings than to actually listen to people, including elected district representatives and safety experts. Any nature is seen as either a thing to be overly normalized or to be constructed upon. Lasiny Ostrov, the Moose Island National Park, has been long divided into two with a circle highway similar to London's M25, and now there are plans to permit construction within the park. There are more highways to come, like the toll road expanding Kutuzovsky Avenue on the west of the city. The expressway hordes constructed all over 
are to form a vast network similar to what was proposed and denied in London a long time ago, on the basis of how terrible the idea was. The grass in the city is constantly trimmed and autumn leaves are removed, but this results not in a golf course look, but an ugly patchy brown mess. Trees are constantly trimmed, making some look like stumps, or cut altogether, making some sites into wastelands worthy of a fallout game. Because of constant beautification of green areas, insects that lived in the soil have been dying, which in past few years resulted in disappearance of sparrows from Moscow. The city, which even has one area named Vorobyovo Gore, Sparrow Hills. Meanwhile, this footage in the background is from Tokyo. The forest park of Kuskova, already squeezed in by northeastern Horde motorway, is due to be heavily beautified. Kuskova was a property of Count Sheremetyev family, and its Soviet authorities which began squeezing in the greenery. The network of ponds was cut through with Unity Street, and the complex network of streams had all but dried. Despite the location close to the border of the city, the new natural equilibrium the forest park had reached is not enough for the city government. The ways are due to be paved in asphalt and receive lighting, and even this tiny pond hidden deep within the park, Sabachi Prud, Dog's Pond, is proposed to be normalized and turned from a nice piece of nature into a regulated rest area. When intervention is needed, it's lacking. Each summer the city is filled with poplar fluff, pretty but problematic for allergic people, and a fire hazard. There are species of poplar that do not produce fluff, and there have been promises to replace the trees, but fluff is still flying, and promises are still promises. The complete failure of the city to understand the environment can be summed up in the constant cleaning of the streets with water, even if there is rain. One slogan of Moscow that wasn't yet mentioned in the series is Moskva – город для жизни. That can be translated to something like Moscow – the city to live in, or Moscow – the city for living. This one is ironic in particular, as the slogan can be seen near one of the heritage places that is due to be demolished. At the time of recording, this tram tunnel underneath the rails of Kursky direction of Moscow Railway is 165 years old. This tunnel was constructed in 1865. It looks gorgeous, and the graffiti only adds to the aesthetics. The quirk of the tunnel is in geometry and in how the rails cross with each other. The city, however, does not see this as a heritage, and Russian railways just want a new concrete grey tunnel under their rails. Russian railways had demolished buildings all around Russia, and even some of the historic buildings they promised to preserve as part of Moscow Central Circle Railway were since quietly demolished. It's not just the Russian railways' fault, it's the fault of the country and the city. Prashka metro station in Moscow opened in 1985 and named after Prague features a unique style as it was designed by Czechoslovak engineers and designers. The station and the entrance areas were coherent in style and tiled in unique Czechoslovak-designed, noise-absorbing tiles. The tiles and the coherent style went to the garbage when in 2015 the entrances were renovated. The government of Moscow does not feel any connection to Moscow, and this was the case throughout the century. Soviet government, in pursuit of their utopia, had demolished monasteries and Sukhrevskaya Tower, turned Arbat district into a highway, post-Soviet government continued to demolish real history. When I once mentioned this to a foreign visitor, the reply was that this is just how the colonial administration acted. And indeed, for the city government, Moscow is a colony, like how for the regime the whole country is, to be exploited, and if something old stands in the way, it must be get rid of. Even Russian Wikipedia has a giant page called A List of Lost Architectural Heritage of Moscow. The Black Book of Arknadzon Architectural Watch Group, the list which covers heritage lost from just 2010 to 2016, covers 115 buildings, and those are just the most prominent ones. With all of this in mind, Moscow government posters for 873rd anniversary of the city in 2020, saying Moskva na kazhdom shagu istoria, Moscow, history at each step, sound quite cynical. Whenever something is restored, this restored often must be put in quotes. When recording the footage for the transport section, I remembered that a few years ago I noticed a blob that replaced an architectural feature from 1952 transfer between Komsomolskaya stations, and yes, that blob remains there to this day. The restoration process often means leaving the facade 
and completely demolishing the internal structure. While restoration takes place, the building might be under the coverings making it look like a low polygon model for years. Moscow Central Post Office and the Art Academy been like that for five or so years. Moscow has a lot of great museums, but the nature of the country today makes it hard for them to do exchange programs. How do you know that the items sent to Moscow would be returned to you? And this not mentioning the sheer toxicity of sending collections to Moscow nowadays. All large exhibitions in Moscow are largely based on what can be surfaced in Moscow, St. Petersburg and smaller cities and towns. Meanwhile, a fairly recent Ukiyo-e exhibition at Edo Tokyo Museum, alongside collections from Japan, had artworks from the museums of the United States, France and Belgium. The exhibition of Hayao Miyazaki that was due to take place in Moscow a few years ago was cancelled. This footage in the background is from an exhibition of Studio Ghibli that took place in Seoul at around the same time as the exhibition in Moscow was to be held. And then there are exhibitions like Russia My History, which tells a glorified version of history similar to the museum adjacent to Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo, that one shrine that has war criminals. Even Moscow Polytechnic Museum with their Russia Makes Its Own exhibition that was opened from 2014 to 2020, focused on how Russia does not need the world with the history of engineering and scientific innovations being Russian. Many of the churches demolished by the Soviets stood the fire of 1812. Moscow bus dismantled in 2020 and much of the heritage demolished recently stood the bombing by Nazi forces from 1941 to 1943. What Heinz Guderian, Fyodor von Bock and Adolf Hitler could not do to Moscow, Sergei Sabanin and his colleague does. Mosques, churches, residential buildings – all could be demolished. But don't you dare touch Vladimir Lenin, or Karl Marx, or Friedrich Engels. At least one Lenin can be served as a skate park. There are Soviet symbols and names everywhere, and Moscow Metro still has plenty of Vladimir Lenin or Karl Marx. In 2009 the entrance area of Kurska Metro Station of the Circle Line was renovated, and there the original Stalin period Soviet anthem was brought back in its full Stalinist glory, quoting, we were raised by Stalin. Among prominent Moscow tourist destinations, there stands Stalinist era exhibition of achievements of national economy, Выставка достижений народного хозяйства, ВДНХ. Glorifying the period, being like a Stalinist Disneyland. For a while there perhaps was a wish to dissociate the exhibition area from the dark past, as ВДНХ was instead officially renamed to All Russia Exhibition Center, Всероссийский выставочный центр, from 1991 to 2013. But apart from that, nothing was done for decommunization, and nowadays the old name is back, while the anthem of ВДНХ that can be heard from the speakers specifically highlights Soviet history. Sometimes ВДНХ is borderline psychedelic in its sheer existence. And despite any common remark on how statues and monuments are history, there are a lot of options that can be done, and in fact are already done either globally or in Moscow. Museon Park, adjacent to Gorky Park, houses plenty of sculptures that were rejected from installation elsewhere. This one of Andrei Sakharov by Grigory Patotsky is one of my favorites. Andrei Sakharov is located on the opposite side to an installation by Evgeny Chubarov, in memory of victims of totalitarianism, which itself is located adjacent to 1939 statue of Iosif Stalin, making him surrounded by faces and bodies of the regime's victims. This is an excellent memorial. This is how a historic discussion can look with the sculptures of tyrants not worthy of public spaces. Nearby there is a path in between Vladimir Lenin's and Leonid Brezhnev's leading to USSR is a bastion of peace display in front of another Lenin and Stalin. There are plenty of Lenins and I'd say the more the merrier. Move all Lenins to one space, make it as absurd as the display of numerous Chiang Kai-shek statues in Suhu Mausoleum. Unfortunately, Museon is not enough, and the choices there are questionable too. The description of the memorial to the victims is all about Stalin's statue without any historic background commentary. The tallest statue in the park is of Felix Dzerzhinsky, the founder of NKVD, predecessor for KGB. The statue was located in front of KGB headquarters at Lubyanka and was demolished after democratic protests in August 1991. The protesters famously decorated the statue with appropriate commentary. Yet the description in the park mentions neither the evil role of Felix Dzerzhinsky nor the history of the removal. And while the statue was moved to the park still covered in comments, 
Those were totally removed in 2015. The statue is the city government protected heritage. It must be clean. In case if the current authorities would like to bring the statue back to Lubyanka. It is up to individuals, people like the International Memorial Society, to remember the names of those killed by the Soviet regime. It's up to them to organize events like the Return of Names. They are the names of murdered individuals recorded in the databases, are spoken by a long line of people in a day-long marathon on Chile, October 29th, before the Day of Remembrance of Political Prisoners. The event takes place at Lubyanka Square, where a stone from a remote island used as a camp Salavki was moved to in 1990 by international memorial activists. The city authorities previously hinted at how they would prefer the event to be moved to an obscure location in front of the officially backed memorial, large but largely hidden from passerbys. That memorial is not even included on nearby signs, and the plagues on the memorial itself are almost unreadable, even if it's been just three years since the inauguration. One is readable, the one that mentions Vladimir Putin as the man behind the project. It is up to the last address project to install small, nearly unnoticeable planks with the names of those murdered by the Soviet regime at the last addresses of where those people lived, and yet the installations often are met with legal opposition as well. Despite the state-approved memorial complex having Remember written on it, remembering is not exactly endorsed. By remembering the atrocities of the past regime, the movements end up being opposed by the current regime, the legal and spiritual successor. This is as seen in court when the International Memorial was prosecuted for supposed inadequate labeling of themselves as foreign agents. The foreign agent status and labeling requirement imposed by the state on non-governmental organizations, private individuals and journalists the regime does not like. It's somewhat reminiscent of the yellow badges Jews were forced to wear under Nazis. In August 2020, the stone of the International Memorial was raided on Moscow International Book Fair, as the authorities checked if the books were labeled as being by a foreign agent. No wonder that the popular memorial to Boris Nemtsov, erected at the spot he was murdered, is often vandalized, and the bridge commonly referred as Nemtsov Bridge nowadays is not to be officially renamed. The attacks happen so often that I once filmed the vandals accidentally. Yet the cities and the country's authorities are happy to enshrine their favorites and install plenty of questionable-looking statues. The most infamous statue of the recent past is the giant Peter the Great, by infamous state-supported sculptor Zurab Tsariteli, erected in 1997. It completely changed the skyline of Moscow River, and the infamy is such that there exists an urban legend that the statue was initially planned to be of Christopher Columbus, but was changed to Peter the Great at the last moment when the United States supposedly denied the monstrosity. It is untrue, of course, but the legend persists. A recent 2017 addition to unnecessary questionable-looking architectural forms was a statue not of Rambu, as it might look from a distance, but of Mikhail Kalashnikov, by another infamous state-supported sculptor Salavat Sherbakov. The statue is installed in front of a recently constructed building, popularly nicknamed as Zigurat, with the whole area having quite an armed with the bodies vibe. The statue was designed so sloppily that it initially featured a Nazi German gun instead of one of Kalashnikovs. Also, the head of St. George behind Kalashnikov is reminiscent of one particular president of Russia. And who can ignore the totally not a homage to Vladimir Putin? in form of the giant Vladimir the Great, erected in 2016 in front of the Kremlin. On August 21, 1991, during the protest against the pro-Soviet coup, three men died in Novorbatsky Tunnel, then known as Tchaikovsky Tunnel. Vladimir Usov, a 37-year-old Russian economist from Ventspils in Latvia, was likely shot to death by the military. Dmitry Kamar, a 22-year-old Russian forklift driver from Moscow Oblast, was likely either shot or crushed to death by an armored vehicle. Ilya Krichevsky, a 28-year-old Jewish architect and hobbyist poet from Moscow, was likely shot to death by the military. Those people died for free, democratic Russia, but their names are known by a very limited number of people. You don't learn of them in schools, there are no statues of them. The only reminder is a small, unnoticeable memorial over the tunnel they died not mentioned in guidebooks, and lacking even pedestrian crossings to it. Quoting Confucius via James Legg, if names be not correct, language is not in accordance with the truth of things. 
If language be not in accordance with the truth of things, affairs cannot be carried on to success. When affairs cannot be carried on to success, proprieties and music do not flourish. Musku and the whole country around is in a dire need of rectification of names. In calling the falsehoods false, in their need of rectifying the names and symbols at stations and streets, in their need of removing the statues or even mummified bodies of tyrants to praise as heroes. However, the falsehoods continue to pile in, with the non-mummified tyrants still governing over Moscow and Russia in general, in form of Sergei Sabyanin and Vladimir Putin, with hundreds of thousands of others, mayors, governors, officials, officers, oligarchs, judges, media persons, vandals, perpetuating the evils. People's Republic of China today is widely known for creating elaborate threads of lies to cover the failings with construction of skyscrapers, airports and stadiums for the shiny picture covering the reality. The occasional visitors and subscribers to propaganda effort are fooled, others are silenced. This, without China, is well familiar to Soviet and post-Soviet residents. Creation of a web of lies both in media and on practice always have been a feature of the Soviet regime. But it's not even originated there, the facade of lies goes centuries back. Think of legendary Potemkin villages. Moscow, being the focal point of Russia, is the center for the regime's web of lies. Every corner that can be cut will be cut, unnoticed on telescreens, and ignored by people in power traveling on cars between their offices, residences and international airports with planes to London ready. After all, those residences and tickets for those flights are likely funded with kickbacks from those cut corners. Musky is the new mythical Babylon, the city glorious in its failings. Musky is the closest one can get to cyberpunk, at least in Europe, if cyberpunk means high-tech and low-life. Cyberpunk-themed games are unrealistic to those who experience the cyberpunk reality of Moscow. Many staffs of Moscow run on gas, but the buildings don't have gas alarms. Perhaps this is because not the gas in staffs, but the gas used for invisible gas lighting would overwhelm any of the alarms. Even writing this story required swimming through the sick, suffocating gas. Why do you only talk of the bad things? Aren't they are good things? Shall a person say this to a victim of abuse? Shall a person beaten by their partner then forget this beating if the partner gives them a new USB charger? Good things never negate bad things. It's impressive to see people at democratic marches vocal despite all the troubles. It's impressive to see expression. It's impressive to see the creativity of even the coffee makers who invented rough coffee decades ago or just recently discovered tonic coffee. Coffee with tonic water and syrup. Look at my paintings, I look at reality whole regardless of good or bad. Of just the good things, their travel guides and Instagram influencer posts. Not to mention the official propaganda. This story is not even all-encompassing. Why don't you talk about failures of other places? Why don't you talk about how everywhere is bad? New York, Tokyo, London. Once again, the failures do not negate each other. A bad choice made simultaneously in Tokyo, London and Moscow does not make it a good choice in Moscow. It is still a bad choice. Problems of Johannesburg, New Delhi, Tel Aviv, Caracas, Antananarivo, Houston, Voronezh, Tehran, Yuzhnokurilsk, Yerevan, Rio de Janeiro, Hong Kong, Malmö, Tbilisi, Kampala, Hebron, San Francisco, Erbil, Kinshasa, Buenos Aires, Beijing, Schopenhagen, Omsk, Minsk do not make problems of Moscow disappear. And between many democratically controlled places and Moscow, there are differences of what shall or shall not be solved within the existing frameworks. I wouldn't mind some of the issues if Moscow government did not try to pump gas light at each tennis screen, did not try to present Moscow as the best city in the world, to present Moscow as something perfect, hoping that everyone would buy into the narrative and not notice the swastikas and dangling cables. I wouldn't mind some of the issues if there was a possibility to oust corrupt and failing mayors and officials. But the city and the country attempt to play the enlightened absolutism game, supposedly governing without the people for the people. But the result is always governing for themselves, with people pushed aside, making one step forward to ten steps backwards.
Many do hate on Moscow, it's a common thing. For me, there are no feelings there. How can you hate a natural disaster? Shall you send your troops to beat up a sea after a storm? A single person would not achieve anything with hatred on the human-made disaster of Moscow and Russia in general. However, ignoring the fire or trying to see the fire as the positive thing is a way to expand the lies into Un's being and lesser Un's existence. It would be a treason to myself to act that, and acting like that for me is simply impossible. This idea is incompatible with my being. Besides, what's especially negative about Moscow? Moscow was bombed in World War II like London with people shattering in the metro like in the tube. Maybe Moscow has no sea, and I haven't mentioned the lack of sea as a negative before, even if I'd prefer there to be one. But so London, Sapporo, Paris also have no sea. And maybe they're less cherries than in Tokyo or Hirasaki, but they do blossom. If some denies Moscow a possibility of being a fair place, they also by definition state the people, peoples of Moscow inherently worse. Sure, there was a century of Soviet plague and the current post-Soviet environment only introduced new horrible plagues, without dealing with the fallout of the past. People of Moscow, like people of all of Russia, are poisoned. But then, if nothing can be done with the poison, what is the other choice? Berlin had managed to overcome the evils spurned on and absorbed by the people. Taipei managed. Seoul managed. As it was sung by Yekaterina Gapenko from Zaporizhia, кто-то должен быть по эту сторону границы. Somebody shall remain at this side of the border. Perhaps there are 50 righteous in the midst of the city. Will you even destroy and not forgive the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in its midst? Far be it from you to do a thing such as this, to put to death the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be like the wicked. Raccoon hangs everyone! This concludes the four-part series. Hopefully, this was a nice watch. Remember to subscribe here and on Patreon. Remember to share the series to others and look at the slice of life paintings of mine. And remember to never give Postmas or not victories to evil.